Welcome everyone to the Board of Selectmen meeting for Monday, January 9th, 2017, a new year. Uh, happy New Year to everybody. First item on the agenda is a proclamation, uh, Mr. Dunn. I move we postpone. Second. Mr. Greeley is not in attendance and he's excited for this one. Moved second. by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Consent agenda. We have the agenda. We have the minutes of the meeting, December 19, 2016. Move approval. Moved by Mr. Second. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Any comments, amendments? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Next, oh, I'm not even following along. We have an appointment, somebody I think we know, <coughs> to the Open Space Committee, Elizabeth Carr Jones, her term to expire January 31st, 2020. You want to come up to the mi microphone and name an address for the record and for those eight people in Arlington who don't know. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Greetings all. Um, I'm Elizabeth Carr Jones. I live at One Lee High Street here in Arlington. And I'm uh, honored to be considered for the Vision 2020 Standing Committee's liaison to the Open Space Committee. Um, and if appointed, I look forward to uh, furthering the goals of, of, of both committees together and um, learning a lot. Awesome. Move approval. Moved by Mr. Burns, seconded by Second. Mr. Dunn. Oh. Okay, Mr. Carroll, uh, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you for all the work you do for the town. You've, been, you've done so many things for so many roles and uh, we really appreciate you working in this one as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, glad to have you back again. <laughs> um, on a motion by Mr. Burns, seconded by Mr. Cura, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. I believe we had someone sign up for Citizens Open for Forum, Marianne? Um, we do. We have a okay, so then I'll read the preamble. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. And if you haven't signed up, you're still welcome to come up to the microphone. But if I could first call on Colin Fredericks. Hey, you just got a seat. <laughs> just. Even though I have it, name and address for the record. Uh, Colin Fredericks, 42 Rawson Road. Welcome. Uh, so, sorry, nervous. Okay. Um, I, there are a lot of my friends who are going to be badly hurt in the next four years by the appointments that our president is making. Uh, I'm really concerned about that and I've been trying to get somebody at the state level to stand up against that and with no success and I realized I should be starting more local so I wanted to raise the idea of having Arlington stand up against that and trying to get some other towns in on this as well and if there's enough support on at the town level then the state may care and if the state may care then uh, the federal government may care. Um, so I wanted to introduce that idea, um, and I realize it won't be considered tonight, um, but perhaps for a, a future agenda. Yes, and I, I did receive your email, um, had conversations with the selectman's office and the town manager, Excellent. and I apologize that I didn't get back to you. We right now have it scheduled for January 23rd. Excellent. And of course you'll be notified, um, and what it is is the town manager and I, it'll probably be two separate agenda items, but back to back. Um, there have been several inquiries that somewhere have a common thread amongst probably two different topics, one of which will be yours. So um, definitely be here on the 23rd. Uh, welcome to speak if you feel there's any material you think the board should have, just email it, drop it off at the selectman's office and it'll be under that agenda item. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I apologize for not letting you know sooner. Mr. Dunn? Will you give me, Lee does to me for like two or three minutes? Uh, definitely. Thank you. So right after the election, the town manager sent an email out to all the town employees. And I read it here at the town, at Selectman's meeting immediately afterwards because I think it was good, on point and to what you're saying. And um, it's worth reading it again. So mm -hmm. uh, this is from town manager to the, all the town employees. Hello all, I'm writing to you today to follow up Tuesday's election and perhaps more importantly, the campaign that preceded it. The tone and rhetoric of the campaign was disturbing to most regardless of your preferred candidate. It has led to many growing concern that hate, fear and contempt will become the new normal. For whatever role I might play in easing those concerns, I want to provide you all with the following insurances and reminders. 
First, the town of Arlington, as an employer, will not discriminate against any individual based on their race, color, religious views, national origin, gender identity or expression, citizenship, age, ancestry, family marital status, sexual orientation, disability, source of income, or military status. Our strength lies in our diversity, and it should be fostered and supported. Second, the town of Arlington is a diverse community, and we value that diversity. We all provide services very well, in, our, in my opinion, to the residents of Arlington, and it is my expectation that those services will be delivered equitably and fairly and without discrimination. Lastly, I want to reassure you that all, that despite all the rhetoric to the contrary, life and work as we know it here in Arlington will go on. We must remain committed to our duties and remember that the residents of Arlington will be looking to us to see how we react in the weeks and months to come. My request to you is that you continue to do the good work in, that you do, and if the opportunity should arise for you to share words of support or even to smile, the resident needs some reassurance that you do so. I think it's worth repeating because I agree with it 100%, and I think, and I know that my colleagues uh, do as well, even if we haven't necessarily taken a, you know, the 5 0 vote that it take. Uh, and so it is our goal and our intent to keep Arlington the welcoming place that it is, and uh, you're, 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 I, I, we're listening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next I have, oh my goodness, I put papers on top of it. Karen Thomas Alia, Alia? If you can say your name correctly, unlike me, an address for the record. Sure, Karen Thomas Alia. I live at 157 Newport Street. Uh, good evening, I'd like to talk with you about the response that the town might have to Measure 4, which legalized recreational marijuana. So as I think you're, hopefully familiar, the measure has a provision in it that towns can have a referendum to opt out of the requirement that they allow stores that sell marijuana. And I would like for Arlington to begin the process of having such a referendum, and hopefully we can start that discussion about how we go through this process of having the referendum. I think it's really important that we have an open debate as a community. Um, Previously, the, the medical marijuana initiative was passed, and there's been some activity for a marijuana dispensary to open up within the town, and that has happened really without many people knowing about what's going on. I mean, I've lived in this town for 12 years, and I myself only found out about the medical marijuana dispensary a couple months ago. Um, I talked with the owner of the preschool that's across the street from this planned dispensary. Um, she's uh, my, my kids go to her after school program and she wasn't even aware that this dispensary is going to open up across the street from her preschool. Most of the parents in this town have no idea that this stuff is going on. There was that town meeting measure last, last fall in what, October and November. Most people thought that was going to make it illegal to have the dispensary. But then there's something like it was actually written by the marijuana industry without putting their name on it at all and saying what it was really about. It was very deceptive. So we need to have a, an open discussion in this town about where we want to go with this. I know that more than half the people in the town voted in favor of this measure, but there's a big difference between saying something should be legal for people in general and wanting it to be down the street from where your kids go to school, right? I mean, most of us, we come here for the good schools. We want to raise our kids in safe neighborhoods. We don't want stores like this down the street from our schools. So we need to have a very open discussion about what this town really wants. Um, and one final item is, I, I don't understand all the, the natures of, of the legalities, but I understand that there, there was a 500-foot buffer zone in the state law prohibiting marijuana, medical marijuana dispensaries to be within 500 feet of, of preschools. But somehow that got voided, and now it looks like we're going to be the only town in the state that's going to have a medical marijuana dispensary within 500 feet of a, not just a preschool, but a pediatrician's office and the nation's oldest children's library. Um, so I, I, I really don't understand how that happened, but if there's a way to rectify that, you know, because it just seems, seems quite wrong. Um, and at least uh, to begin the process of... Um, correcting this dis deficiency in our, in our zoning rules, right? I mean, somehow we don't have this buffer zone in our, in our town, even though the state recommended it. So if we can start the process of, of correcting that and implementing this buffer zone. And if I could, I do know, um, I know we have an agenda item tonight, but I think we're 
with Attorney Heim not being here. Can you? Are we going oh no, to I'm prepared to speak to it. Okay, Agen agenda item 10 kind of runs a parallel course to something that you're, you're talking <coughs> about right now, and um, my colleagues or the town manager can correct or amplify um, on the second point about the buffer zone because we've been following it, even though it's um, come before the Arlington Redevelopment Board, the ARB. Everything seemed to be moving in the summer, and, and the way I understand it, the state agency um, put out a clarification, a statement um, regarding their regulations. Uh, subsequent to that, I believe there was some form of communication with that state agency where they gave, in my opinion, sort of a contradictory opinion to their original opinion. And the way I've been following it right now, it seems like everything, I don't want to say is in limbo, but I know our town council, uh, can you do a better job? I know he's been working on it to get some clarification. It, it may have already been clarified, but I'm not, not, not that I've heard. So I, <clears throat> I guess I, I would say that, um, if I, can I take a, a further step Definitely. back? That to, yeah, to be, to be very clear, there is a very distinct legal separation between recreational marijuana that recently passed on the ballot and uh, medical marijuana. So there's two different legal processes that the town follows and the board could choose to follow. And if it's the chair's prerogative, we'll talk a little bit about recreational marijuana and that path under agenda item 10. 10. Thank you. Um, in terms of what's happened over the course of the past six months with medical marijuana, um, or, maybe, or even longer than that, uh, several years back when the town adopted zoning for medical marijuana, at that time, the state's Department of Public Health's guidance was that city or towns could choose to put into their zoning as they considered it a buffer zone or use the state's default 500 foot buffer zone. And at that time, what was recommended to town meeting <coughs> was adopting zoning that wouldn't specify a buffer zone, but rather utilize the state's default 500 foot buffer zone. Uh, more recently, within the uh, past six months, the state issued uh, changed guidance that no longer said that a town could rely on the Department of Public Health's 500 foot buffer zone. So. Um, uh, part of what you said um, depicted this, the town not utilizing the state's uh, buffer zone when we actually wanted to, and the mm -hmm. state changed their mind and said that we could not after a vote was taken. Um, but I do think it's important to point out also, though, that the state doesn't necessarily define, um, and there's, there's actually still dialogue about this, a pediatrician's office or a library as a place where children congregate, which is what the impact or the sort of the definition of where a buffer zone has to be from. Um, so that's a lot of... A lot of words, but I think to, to your point, Ms. Mahan, there is no actual, there's no further ambiguity um, that, that we're working through. Uh, I think we do feel as though there's legal liabilities where, um, you know, certainly citizens could take action against the applicant if they didn't feel satisfied with, uh, with the process. Uh, had we, um, the town, chosen to deny the permit to the applicant, I think we also felt there were significant liabilities on the part of the town with the applicant. So there's this situation that I described in terms of the Department of Public Health created, um, did create confusion and potential legal liability no matter the outcome. And that's on medical marijuana. That's on medical marijuana. Which we're also right, two, two issues, but. Uh, so just, I'll, I'll yeah, give you sure. one more minute only because it's supposed to be three minutes and we're really not supposed to get okay. into a big long discussion about something that's not on the agenda. We do have recreational marijuana on the agenda for tonight. So if you want to just make a statement, I can't, I don't want us to get an open meeting law violation. Understood, understood. I appreciate your response, but I haven't heard a clarification to the medical marijuana buffer zone. Does Arlington have a clear buffer zone? No. Are we taking steps to rectify that? I am currently not aware of any actions being taken. All right, taken. I'm gonna no. stop it there, okay, okay honestly. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't mean to be rude, but it's it's not on the agenda. Um, but feel free to contact the <coughs> selectman's office or the town manager, and perhaps we can give a more definitive answer uh, is, should it be an agenda item for this board? Should it be Arlington Redevelopment Board? Should it be something else? God bless you. Because um, I don't want you to think, I'm just telling you, you have the question out there and it hasn't been answered. So we'll follow up on it. All right, thank you. Um, anyone else? Oh, anyone else for Citizens Open Forum? If not, Citizens Open Forum is closed. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, traffic rules and order, agenda item five for approval, amendment to schedule one. Um, and Andrea Nicolay, director of libraries, hello. Hi. Good to see you. Nice. nice to see you as well, thank you. So the Fox Library. Um, if you could just say your name and position. Oh, sure, Andrea Nicolai, director Sorry. of libraries. Thank you. 
Um, so we have a library van that is typically parked at Robbins. Every day the van has to go to the Fox Library to make a delivery. Um, with the new handicapped parking space at the corner of Cleveland and Mass Ave, um, there's, there's an extra space behind it that used to be a no parking zone that is now parking um, for you know, re a regular parking space. Um, so what we're proposing is to make that parking space a library van parking only space so that the van can do its deliveries on a daily basis. Move approval. Moved by Mr. Burns, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Uh, second. Uh, hey, uh, oh, wait a second. Hey, gentlemen down on cable, we can hear you. Glenn, Sean, we can hear you guys. Okay, sorry. Uh, would so I know the, I read in uh, Officer Rateau's memo, and I was curious what your reaction would be if we limited the no parking to like I don't know regular business hours right. on a weekday or like not you know not evenings, not Sundays. Like what's I want to both make the, it usable when mm -hmm. it, we can. So mm -hmm. what would be, is there some time frame there that you say, oh yeah, this would totally be, we don't want the, rest we don't need the reserved space? I think weekends and holidays could be excluded. Okay, evenings or? Not evenings because okay. that's when the deliveries happen no typically. Oh, oh. Yeah. Fine, all right. Uh, Steve, cool. all right, so excluding weekends and holidays? Perfect. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, on a motion by Mr. Burns, seconded by Mr. Dunn, is there anyone here to speak to this? Any further comments with that friendly amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Agenda item five, five <laughs> request sign on letter for clean energy against new pipeline tax and unnecessary new pipelines. Um, this is sponsored by the Mothers Out Front, and I have three names. I don't know if all three of you are here. Carol's, well, if you are, why don't you get up, say your name and address for the record. Hi, I'm Carol Saunders Chamberlain and live at 990 Massachusetts Avenue, Unit 61. Good evening, and thank you for allowing us time to speak to you. Mothers Out Front is part of the Mass Power Forward Coalition. It's a statewide coalition which is circulating a letter addressed to the state legislature for mayors and members of Board of Selectmen to consider signing. The co coalition is doing this with the urging of and input from its members. The legislative session is underway, and this letter asks the state legislators to support upcoming legislation that will prohibit legalizing any form of pipeline tax, prevent any other scheme to force consumers to accept unnecessary pipelines, that we cannot afford and that prevent us from complying with the law enacted in the Global Warming Solutions Act, <coughs> and to prioritize greater investment in energy efficiency, demand response, renewable resources, and energy storage. There are many reasons to not build major new gas pipelines. We don't need them. Methane gas is heavily contributing to global warming. The fracked gas is toxic to human health and pipeline construction harms our natural environment. Now I'll say a little bit more about each of those points. We don't need new pipelines. The Massachusetts Attorney General commissioned a detailed study of how best to meet the state's electricity reliability needs. The study showed increased gas capacity is not needed to meet the state's electric reliability needs. It found no regional electric reliability issues through 20, 2030. It found cheaper, cleaner alternatives to new gas pipelines to meet worst case power scenarios while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It found that building new pipelines would be the most costly alternative for Massachusetts ratepayers and would substantially increase greenhouse gas emissions. Point two. Methane is contributing heavily to global warming. Natural gas is 95% methane, and over a 20-year time frame, methane warms the planets 86 times more than carbon dioxide. Point three, fracked gas is harmful to human health. Fracked gas coming through this pipeline infrastructure carries toxic and carcinogenic chemicals, as well as radioactive elements from the fracking sites. These are released at many points in the distribution system and are especially harmful to residents of communities nearby compressor stations and other large pipeline infrastructure. Four, pipeline construction harms the natural environment. <coughs> we, 
Wildlife loses habitat and open space is lost when trees are clear cut for pipelines. Toxic emissions harms trees, plants, and animals, as well as humans. Our air, our water, and our soil is affected. In conclusion, we are proud of Arlington's commitment to energy efficiency, additional solar energy, and other important steps that Arlington has taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the past few years, including our upcoming community choice aggregation program. We hope that you will decide to sign this letter, opposing a pipeline tax, unnecessary new pipelines, and supporting more clean energy for our state. Global warming is real. Our children are counting on us. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have any questions. Mr. Carroll? Thank you very much. Thank you for all your work on this and all of the, the information <coughs> you provided. I, I was wondering if you could just describe in a little bit more detail the pipeline tax, because um, it's, it's referenced several times in the letter, but the, yes. the, no specifics really. This, the <coughs> electric utility companies want to tax electricity consumers to pay for uh, construction of new pipelines, and this is what we refer to as a pipeline tax. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court rejected this tax as uh, um, currently illegal in Massachusetts because um, under the um, Electricity Restructuring Act, the utility, you know, electric consumers are not supposed to pay for um, other forms of, of energy. Right now, the um, Spectra, Eversource, and National Grid are looking to have the legislator um, make amendments to the law to make this legal or to put the whole thing on people who have gas delivered to their homes. And they have a number of other creative schemes um, for this, but that, that is a pipeline tax. Even though the judicial, Supreme Judicial Court ruled against it, it's not definitively dead because it could be legitimized by new legislation. Um, I, I have a question, and we'll get back to um, this board and any actions we decide to take. I'm just curious in terms of um, other outreach, have you contacted like Senator Donnelly or any of the legislators that are really closer to this? I know that um, Gail McCormick has been in close touch with um, Sean Garbley, yeah, and we know that there are people are active. Th this is January is the month where you know the legislative agenda and, and bills are, are getting set up. And so there are people in the Senate and the House working on this. I believe members, more members of the Mass Power Forward Coalition and other Mothers Out Front people are in um, contact. And these type of letters really help provide support to those legislators. Right. As they try to get. No, no, I understand. I, I, I yeah. agree with that, but I would say to really make it more than just a letter, if if that's what the board so chooses in any form of deviation. But I understand the three points that you have in there. Um, it, in order to make it not just be a letter, I really would encourage, and I know Representative Gobbling, I always mm -hmm. hear him be extremely responsive, and and Representative Dave Rogers, who also has four or six precincts in mm -hmm. Arlington. But especially the senator where he's, what, 147 or yeah. 152, um, I would say as a next step um, yeah. for any city or town, um, th that needs to be a partnership that's well established. You all um, speak very eloquently and uh, consistently um, mm -hmm. for your cause. And um, I think carrying that on to our legislative de delegation. And I, I don't mean to pick on the senator, but yeah. you know, he, yeah. he does have, a, he has a leadership position and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, so, yeah. but anyways, I, it, if you want to answer that and then I'm gonna call yes, on Mr. Dunn. Yes, I would Dunn. like my colleague who's more familiar with this part. Well, I don't know, but they, um, uh, all of our legislature voted against the pipeline tax last year mm -hmm. and 97 senators and we have appointments set up with, uh, um, Representatives Roger Garbley and, uh, and awesome. Senator Donnelly on the 25th Great. of this month, which is a climate lobby day uh, in the state. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dunn and then Mr. Byrne. Uh, I respect the work the Mothers Up Front does a lot, and I'm very happy to support the Community Aggregation Act. 
I don't feel sufficiently educated on this issue to take a position or on behalf of the town. Uh, it's, I believe in the climate change is happening. I believe that there are things that we have to do and I believe that Arlington is taking a lot of steps and I've supported the ones that I can feel passionate about. Not even the ones that I can support. I don't even have to have a huge passion for it. But unfortunately, this particular issue, there's, uh, it's complex and I know that there's other sides to it and I just don't know enough. And uh, w without that knowledge, I'm, um, I personally have a very hard time uh, signing on to this letter. Mr. Barr? Um, I was curious what other communities have signed on to the letter. This, this is, um, the, the process of circulating this letter has just begun. I believe that um, the mayor of Somerville is going to be signing it tonight. Does anybody else have any? You're one of the first. Yes, <laughs> that's a good question. It's been sent out to a number of mayors. It's on the way. And, um, and to many boards of selectmen. Um, we do have a little more time than we thought um, because it is difficult to, um, you know, boards of selectmen don't meet every week mm -hmm. and they originally wanted to have it by the 20th and uh, it would be great to have it by then, but we do, you know, we are, extending the deadline a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, I would just like to ask Mr. Dunn is uh, we'll oh, oh I'm so sorry. We don't do back and forth. I'll sorry. Let you, I'll let you I have so sorry. again at the end but I'm going to let Mr. Byrne sorry. Just sorry. The process. I apologize. Um, so w when I saw this I think a, a lot of it um, my mind or when we got to it tonight I started thinking about uh, Colin's comments uh, during Citizens Open Forum and about um, you know, a, a lot of the concerns people have at the federal level and what can we do to kind of protect ourselves and I don't want to say insulate ourselves uh, at this point because I don't really, you know, climate change isn't something that we can just solve here in Arlington or even Massachusetts or maybe even the United States. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it is, you know, now um, more important than ever that, you know, communities, you know, kind of take important stances like this to make sure that all of the work that's been done um, on the federal level, on the regional level, um, can, can continue and that we continue to keep it a, a top level priority. And I, um, um, throughout the next four, hopefully four years. Um, and so I, I'd be comfortable uh, um, signing this and, and moving support on it. I, I think that you know, it, it's aligned with um, where we should be going. And um, I, I do understand it's, it's complex, but I, I think it is important that you know, at, at the local level we, we do start you know, paying, paying a bit more attention to, to issues like this and maybe you know, inserting ourselves in the conversation when, when we can. Mr. Carroll? Uh, I'm also very sympathetic to this. I, I think that it, um, <laughs> in particular, it, it kind of helps leverage one of the other projects that Mothers Out Front just pursued, which was trying to address the gas leaks, which this board did, did mm -hmm. support legislation around the gas leaks. Um, and, and I think using this as a, as a bit of a lever to try to get that, that issue addressed first is important. That said, I think that in the past, when we've had ish, um, uh, been asked to endorse lobbying letters like this, it's generally been our practice that if we cannot reach consensus as a, as a full board, that we, those of us who feel that we can sign on have offered to, to sign on as individuals. Now, I don't know if that's an option with, with um, the campaign as it's, as it's structured right now, but uh, that, that is, we don't even have a full board here mm. tonight. It's just, um, I think it's difficult because this isn't a situation where we have a, a public hearing per se and, and, and a published vote and, 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 and such um, the way we would in a town meeting action. And so it, it really puts uh, colleagues either who are absent or, or who don't feel you know they can sign on at this, this time in a difficult position if the board is adopting this, this, this position. It kind of implies that we're all in consensus. So for my own part, I'm not sure that, that we're in a position. My own feeling is that uh, we're not in a position here to endorse this as as a board, um, but I'd be willing to talk to mothers up front about potentially signing as, as an individual. Um, 
official. I, I'd be compulsory. Not we make, well, you know, the individual yeah, as well, if that's an option. Mr. Dunn. I'll also say, uh, I don't, I absolutely don't feel passionately, I'm not passionately opposed to this either. And I wouldn't, yeah. if, if the if the, my colleagues choose to support this, I'm not going to be, you know, upset or hurt. Like, that's why we've got a board. I don't think, um, I think it, like, you know, if I was on the other side of this, I would, and, or, and I, you know, maybe I'm going to be on the other side of another vote someday in the future. Uh, I don't mind if it's not unanimous. So I, I respect, uh, thankful, thank you, but do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm hearing two things and two things we can possibly do. We can take the vote tonight, um, possibly not unanimous with Mr. Greeley, um, who unfortunately isn't mm -hmm. feeling very well at all. That's why he's not here tonight. Or as well as um, one of my colleagues, you know, does have some questions and a request for more information. Um, I'd also put, it's up to my colleagues to make motions. Um, we could also perhaps um, put this back on the January 23rd agenda, have the opportunity to get some more information to us individually, then have a full board, um, you know, not necessarily mm -hmm. rehearing and doing everything over again, but also bringing Mr. Greeley up to speed. So um, either a, a motion, I guess, to approve or a motion to um, postponed to January 23rd, so I leave it to my colleagues. I'm gonna move approval. Moved by Mr. Byrne, is there a second? Okay, I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Kiro. Okay, any further discussion? I promised I'd give you, you wanted to say something very briefly at the end? I have to apologize because I just missed what you voted on. Okay. We haven't, we haven't voted, voted yet. yet. <laughs> you haven't voted yet. I would just like to say that we would be happy to meet with individually, um, answer questions, provide um, more resource material to help anyone become more comfortable um, with this. I think the Attorney General's um, study is very convincing and I, we would be happy to do that and then have it um, reconsidered on the 23rd. Well, we, we have a motion right now to move approval, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Okay. Any, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, uh, any abstentions? Abstain. So it's approved. Oh. Three and one abstention. And then um, please, I encourage you to follow up with that information, including for our colleague, Mr. Uh, Greeley. Um, and I'll be sure either myself or the vice chair, whoever <coughs> speaks with them first, will we'll sort of give them a synopsis of what went on tonight. So we approved it. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, uh, agenda item six, uh, presentation from the bike share working group. I'm not sure who's. I can introduce it if that. Yes, Mr. <coughs> Town Manager. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as the board knows, one of its uh, goals during our annual goal setting session is to investigate uh, bike sharing options or opportunities for Arlington. So uh, a bike share working group made up of representatives from the planning the community development department, uh, ABAC and TAC uh, have been working on a bike share um, study group and they have a report to provide to the board for tonight to inform the board and also to get a little feedback from the board on what um, the board's prerogative would be moving forward. And I believe tonight we have Seth Fitterspiel from TAC as well as Nat Strasberg from the planning office. I don't know if Nat's coming forward or if he's just here for moral support, but uh, I thought if Seth is ready, I'll turn it over to him. Um, just name an address for the record. Uh, we don't have a podium. <laughs> we are not podium equipped, uh -huh. sorry. <laughs> sorry? Um, well, would I sit there? Or? No. Yeah. I guess I <laughs> yeah, you want to move over yeah, one? If you don't mind, that'd be great, just because it's going to be a few minutes. And We're going to have to fix the microphone, and then when you start, you say your name and address for the record, just for downstairs, so. Let me just bring the microphone. Oh, no, just, why don't I just slide this one down? Oh, okay. Or do you want him there? Actually, just Actually, sit here. That's easier. Why sit right you here. Sit right there. I made it hotter than I had to make I won't sure. ask you any legal questions. Yeah. <laughs> great, this is my chance to get my way all the time. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see someone else. Do you want to chair? Sean, do you want to chair? Just so you don't. You're much younger than I, but I would, after about four minutes, I'd feel the burn. I know yeah. it. And uh, are you all set on your end, or Sean? Yeah, we're all good. 
Okay. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, thanks very much for having me. Um, again, my name is Seth Fetterspiel. Um, I'm a representative of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, I'm, I apologize in advance. I'm also under the weather tonight, so I appreciate oh, the seat. Going around. <laughs> I may need a, uh, a nose blow. The, the grilly seat chatting. is available. Yeah, yeah, no, seriously. Um, okay, so thanks again for having me. Um, the town manager asked me to come in and give you an update on our research about uh, potentially bringing bike share to Arlington. Um, so if you want to go ahead to the next slide. Um, so a small working group has been doing some initial research about bike share options for Ar Arlington, um, including myself from TAC, um, Scott Smith from TAC and the um, Arlington Bike Advisory Committee, and we've been working with Nat Strasberg from the Planning Department as well. Next slide. So bike share, as you're probably familiar, is uh, a system that has really gained a lot of popularity in recent years among cities to provide um, alternative transportation modes um, that encourage active transportation um, as, well in, as well as reducing vehicle traffic. Um, and the bike share system that we have in the Boston area that you're probably familiar with is the Hubway system. Next slide. So there are a host of benefits that come along with bike share that could apply uh, here to Arlington. Um, starting with uh, business growth. Um, so bikes have been um, studied and, and shown to um, increase local business development as bicycle riders tend to travel at a slower pace and are more likely to take a stop and stop in a coffee shop or a store to do some errands along the way. And with bike share, you can strategically place the stations uh, in business districts to encourage that kind of um, activity. Um, bike share works great with transit by providing what we call the first mile, last mile connection. So for folks that live near to transit, um, so in our case uh, to Alewife where there's currently a hubway station um, or to the bus routes that, that go through Arlington, uh, having bike share can help them get from their homes to the transit stations and back and forth. Um, so again, increasing the use of that transit. Um, bike share can improve public health as well as attract new uh, cyclists by encouraging more biking. Um, where it's great that we have the Minuteman pathway here in town, so uh, bike share could help increase the use of that resource and break down some barriers to cycling for folks who don't have their own bike. They might not want to invest you know, hundreds of dollars in a new bike, but can spend just a few dollars to, to take out a um, bike share bike on a day. Um, bike share does, uh, can help to reduce vehicle <coughs> traffic and, and thereby reducing congestion, improving air quality, as well as addressing climate change. Um, and bike share, as it has gained popularity among communities, has really become an, uh, a desirable trait for communities to show their uh, livability, to have alternative transport um, routes and, and encourage um, pop an active population. Um, and finally, uh, again, generating investment in local business, not only through the um, patronization of those businesses, but also providing a sponsorship opportunity for those businesses that can bring attention to them. Next slide. So that was kind of the high level overview and now I'm gonna get into a series of slides that briefly outline um, the research we've done about some of the specific options for Arlington. So the first option that we looked into is called Zagster. Um, Zagster is a local uh, smaller operator that has a lease model. So the way it works is that they lease the bike um, and station equipment to the community and the community pays a user fee for uh, the lease as well as the services that go along with that. Um, and Zagster approached Arlington along with Lexington and Bedford with the idea of creating a, a bike share system just along the Minuteman pathway. Um, Hubway, as you know, again, is the existing bike share system in Greater Boston, and its model is different than Zagster because the community actually owns the hardware, so they, the community would own the bikes and the stations. And um, again, this is operated by um, a company, it's a national company called uh, Motivate, and so they operate a number of the larger bike share systems around the country. Um, and then a third option um, that we haven't gotten as far into, but we were asked to include in the list, would be a local uh, kind of system from the ground up. Um, an example of this is the uh, bike share in Salem. It's called Salem Spins, which is kind of an alternative bike rental program. And so this would give Arlington uh, a lot of flexibility in the system it would provide, but it would, less, it would probably just be for Arlington and it would be up to us to do all of the legwork to put it together. Next slide. So um, there's a lot on this. I'm hoping that you've had a chance to maybe look at these ahead of time or can afterwards. Um, 
But again, some of the basic uh, differences between the systems. Um, so Zagster is it's more of a recreational bike kind of re re rental alternative. Um, it's, it's appropriate for round trips. The bikes are fairly lightweight. They have locks built into them. Um, so it's a way for people to take a bike kind of out for a spin for a while. Um, it's a little bit more limited in its point-to-point -point capability. Um, and most of the, it's really centered around the bikes themselves. The stations don't have as much technology on them or flexibility to, to take out and use the bikes. Um, and a key question for the connectivity of Zagster, if we were to go that model, is, is what um, Lexington and Bedford, in this case, would choose to do. Um, Hubway, on the other hand, um, would be growing a fairly extensive existing network. Um, there are uh, over 100 stations in uh, Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, and Brookline. And there's also interest from um, Medford, uh, Belmont, Newton, among other communities, to join the system. And currently, Hubway is uh, renegotiating its contract with Motivate, so this is actually a pretty good time to think about new communities joining, because there's an opportunity to become part of that new contract. Um, it's more of a commuter or errand-based, again, point-to-point -point model, so the bikes are really meant to be taken on short trips. Um, but there is certainly the cap uh, capacity for some recreational route. I, I ride up the Minuteman frequently myself, and I often see people on Hubway bikes that they've presumably taken out from Ale Life all the way out to Bedford even, which is impressive. Um, oh, and I wanted to mention that, as it says here, there are about 200 current Hubway members who live in Arlington. Excellent. Like, I'm glad to see like that. Like this one. <laughs> exactly. Well, I thought you used that to open teeny little Pepsi bottles. Uh, no, this is this is how I get my Hubway. Oh, is that? Oh, that's the. Yeah, this oh. is that qualify as product placement, Dan? <laughs> I'm, I get, I'm, I'm one of the 200. I didn't see it before. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Didn't, I didn't know it was coming. Yeah. But um, um, segue back. Thank oh. you. Um, and then again, the local system, we have fewer details of this because we don't have a specific proposal in front of us. Um, but you know, presumably, we could build it to, to fit our specific needs. Um, but as I said before, it's more likely to be specific to Arlington and not connect to other communities around. And uh, like Zagster would require kind of starting over in terms of recruiting new riders as opposed to building off of those already part of Hubway. Next slide. Um, so I have a series of slides here just to give you a picture of what the equipment um, and technology looks like a little bit. So in the same order, um, this is what a Zagster bike looks like. It's kind of a cruiser bike. Um, it, it's a fairly stock bike that you could buy at a bike shop. Um, as I mentioned, it's a little bit uh, lighter, um, which makes it a little bit easier to ride, but has the disadvantage of potentially being a little less durable. Um, it also has more gears, and it has a lock that goes with the bike. So again, it's, it's more suited to longer trips where you would stop along the way without using stations in between. Next slide. Um, the stations, uh, the Zyster stations are also fairly lightweight and quite modular, um, and the standard station has space for 10 bikes. Um, one important difference is that Zagster's service includes less balancing, which is the moving of bikes between stations to make sure that there are bikes at every station and open spaces at every station. Um, and they do that, I think they said about once a week. Um, so it's, it's much less frequent than what we see with Hubway. Next slide. Um, just to show you what the bike looks like in the station, so the lock on the station um, attaches to the lock on the bike itself. And next slide. Um, and the user interface, so unlike the key that Mr. Dunn has, um, with Zagster, you actually have to use a phone. Um, you can use a dumb phone. Um, they can send you a code that way, but <coughs> I imagine most people have smartphones. Um, you need to pre-register for an account, and then to unlock the bike, you um, go online with your phone and say you want to unlock a bike, and it gives you a code, and you then enter the, that code into the bike keypad, so it's a two-step process. Next slide. Uh, the Hubway bikes, you've probably seen these before. Um, they're, they're very heavy duty <coughs> bikes, um, so they're not a great bike to ride if you want to you know, go for a sprint, but they're yeah. um, totally indestructible and they're meant to be comfortable for a wide variety of users and are pretty easy to get around town. Um, again, they, they don't have a lock on them, so they're really meant for the point to point between the stations. Next slide. Um, the stations are also pretty heavy duty, and the locks are included in the station. So when you put the bike into the station, it automatically locks. Um, the station has capacity, standard stations have capacity for 20 bikes. They're about 40 feet long. 
And um, in contrast to Zagster, Hubway's service includes balancing up to multiple times a day, depending on what's needed in the community. Next slide. Um, so the user interface, as Mr. Dunn showed us, is if you're a member, you have this little key card and you just insert it into the station, um, the dock where there's a bike, and you take out the bike. It's very quick and easy. Um, but if you don't have a key card, if you're not a member, a casual user can just use the uh, station itself and you enter a credit card um, and then it gives you a code for that bike. So there's no phone or, or pre-existing membership required to do that. Next slide. Um, just wanted to briefly talk about potential locations. So uh, first, it, I apologize for the small size, but um, at the bottom right of the screen, you can see three red um, boxes, and those are the existing stations at the border of uh, Cambridge and Arlington. So there are two current stations at Alewife, and there's one station in North Cambridge at the intersection of the bike path headed towards um, Davis. Uh, Cambridge is also planning on putting in a new station as part of this new contract and expansion um, at the intersection of Mass Ave and Route 16. So that'll be right on the border with East Arlington. Yeah, it's cut off in this map, but there is a station at Teal Square in Somerville on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I think it would be worth encouraging them to, um, and I imagine there's, you can see from the map um, that there's interest in putting in a station at Clarendon Hills, which would be useful for us. So all of the blue boxes are suggested stations by existing Hubway users. Um, I promise that I didn't go on and plant <laughs> all these stations. <laughs> I was going to say, you're kind of zealous there, but for you. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. Um, so, so you can see that there's existing station interests throughout Arlington, certainly centered around East Arlington and commercial districts, um, such as uh, the intersection of Lake Street and Mass Ave, and obviously Arlington Center, um, as well as along the bike, um, the bike path. So as we, you know, if we were to move forward with this and consider pl station placements, we'd really want to think about kind of how we want to use the resource and do we want more of a linear path to, to parallel the bike path and Mass Ave or do we potentially want to concentrate more at least to start out with um, in the eastern part of Arlington to create more density in a smaller area and, and one important consideration for that will be if, um, if and when Bed, uh, sorry, Medford and Belmont do move forward with joining and whether we want that kind of lateral accessibility in addition to the or south. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide. Um, so, uh, and we're getting towards the end. Um, so, in terms of the cost, um, I want to emphasize that these are all really preliminary figures. So, we continue to work with um, any of the service providers um, as well as thinking about the, the user revenue and the sponsorships to lock down a more concrete cost estimate. Um, but that said, obviously the key difference here between Zagster and Hubway is that Zagster, because it's a lease model, has no upfront capital costs, whereas Hubway has a fairly significant capital cost. It's about 50000 per station. Um, so that's the big difference. Um, then they both also have an annual fee um, to cover the maintenance, the rebalancing to the extent that it's available, uh, the customer support. Um, and then there's this question of, of the revenue. And so there's two main revenue sources to look forward to. Um, so one is the user fees. Um, so depending on the level of use and the pricing structure um, that's set by the community, you'd expect you know, a certain amount of user revenue. Um, part of the reason we see it higher for Hubway here is because given that it's already an established system, we imagine it having more use. Um, and then there's also the question of sponsorship. So as part of this new contract, the existing Hubway communities are pursuing a title sponsor, which is someone like a Citibank um, in, for the bike share system in New York, which is called City Bike. Um, and so by giving away the name to the system, you can bring in a fair amount of revenue. And then uh, we can also pursue more local sponsors. So going out to you know, large businesses or even small businesses and you know, maybe a sponsor or a bike campaign to help bring in more revenue. Um, so again, these numbers are pretty preliminary, um, but the way it adds up is that um, for, for the Hubway proposal, you know, they expect the sponsorships to last about five years, and um, with these potentially optimistic numbers, it would actually end up making the town money, um, about $200,000 over the five years. I don't know if we'd quite get to that level, but it at least gives the, a fairly large buffer to break even over that time period. That's, on this, that's it for this slide. Um, last couple slides. So in terms of where we are moving forward, um, so Zagster uh, has presented to the communities a few times, and they would be ready to move forward um, in 
2017 with a deployment um, if the communities were to sign on. They require a three-year contract um, to sign up for the lease for this, that three-year period, and then you can renegotiate from there. Uh, for Hubway, so as I've been mentioning, the current cities are finalizing their new contract, and they're going to be going out to their solicitation um, for a title sponsor in the near future. Um, but the existing cities have decided that they want it, that solicitation to be solely for the existing cities in a round one, and then to have it be for new cities in a round two. And so that would be looking at a summer time frame for that round two solicitation for additional sponsors. Um, so really, I think the timing on Hubway is, is, is about bringing in the funding. If, if Arlington you know, wanted to pay for it today and, and that would work, then I'm sure Hub, Hubway certainly has the capacity to expand, but it's really about the, um, the system design and bringing in the, any outside financing. Um, and for a local system, this really is dependent on, on the um, internal capacity to design and, and put together a system and go through any solicitation associated with that. Next slide. Um, so again, in summary, um, you know, Zagster I, we see as a, it's a system that could be a, a good alternative to a traditional bike rental system. Um, it could work as a, as a, you know, network along the Minuteman, but would not have connectivity beyond that. Um, Hubway is an already established system with um, the regional connections that we know about and real ex uh, potential to expand in the future. It's also quite scalable. Um, so if Arlington, the, the cost I gave, showed earlier was for five stations, if Arlington wanted to start with fewer stations, that is something that we could consider um, to cut initial costs, but then have the potential to expand in the future, or we could start with the five stations and, and again expand um, from there in the future. And the local system um, would you know, probably offer us the most degree of flexibility, but would also require the greatest upfront um, investment in terms of both human um, and potentially financial capital to figure that all out and get it going. Um, and so for next steps, last slide. Um, so a couple things that are ongoing right now that'll help us uh, continue to figure this out if we so choose. Um, we have included a couple of questions in the current Vision 2020 survey, specific, specifically asking Arlington residents about their interest and awareness of bike share, um, including where they would uh, most like to see bike share stations and their likelihood to use it and how they would see using it. Um, we should certainly keep in touch with Lexington and Bedford about their interest in Zagster or also in Hubway. Um, there's no reason that Hubway couldn't make it out there um, if, if they have the interest for that. And then certainly, um, if we are interested in Hubway, keeping track of the contract negotiations which are being organized by MAPC um, with the existing communities and uh, watching that process as it goes forward and then when it comes time for that round two uh, sponsor solicitation, hopefully being ready to indicate interest in being part of that process. So that's it for my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Thank you very much. It's excellent, excellent presentation. Um, I want to say in looking through this, to, to, to my mind, um, well, first of all, a local system I think is out of, is out of the question. I don't, it makes no sense to me whatsoever to, make, to create an isolated system. But even looking at the other, at the other two and understanding the, um, the pros and cons as, as you've laid them out uh, so excellently, um, I don't think there's a choice other than Hubway myself. I mean, when I look at, look at the bike sharing uh, approach, even setting aside the environmental and, and health benefits, I think this is an important part of our economic development um, strategy as well. If we were to join a, a larger network that already exists, I mean, we, we're always trying to bring people you know, into Arlington to come visit Arlington and, and connect them <coughs> onto an existing system, I think helps us to do that. But flipping it around the other way as well, I mean, we've, we've as a board and as a town, we've taken a strong stance in um, <clears throat> supporting uh, multi-use development along our major corridors right now, and that implies um, creating housing units that have less parking available, and we need to have other you know, options um, available to folks who live there, and I think that having this as a commuter option that actually links into the rest of the MBTA system so directly just makes so much more sense. And your, the figures that you put out here, I mean, if, if it were to come to fruition, we were bringing in 100 
$96,000 per year. So that, that covers the, um, even with the five station model, that covers um, all the oper annual operating costs and leaves $71,000 after that towards you know, um, acquisition of the stations, which I presume would be capitalized in some, in some way. Um, so uh, this is an excellent presentation, and um, I'd never really thought about Zagster, but from my own view, if, if we were to pursue this, I feel much more comfortable going with a, a network that's already there and that we are very confident is expanding rather than um, going with a, a more limited recreational model uh, with you know Lexington Bedford where it sounds like they're not really very far along and they're thinking on this unless I'm wrong yeah and my understanding is that Bedford is less interested in it than they were initially because they feel like they they have a pretty popular bike rental store at the end of the Minuteman and I think that shop is not excited about the idea of having competition yeah and so to, to, to my mind you know Zagster Implementing a Zagster model, just us in Lexington, our stations are essentially serving as feeders to to the Lexington. But but I, I think we have much greater, and not to mention the user base, an already existing user base here in t in town of um, constituents. Um, that's my own two cents, mm -hmm. just my first blush. And I, I know you were very um, you were very even-handed in your presentation between them, but but. Did the committee actually have a preferred choice? Not yet, right? The, well, when you, mean, when you so I, I would say <clears throat> I really only just started talking with the committee in the past week as the presentation was coming towards finale. Yeah. It, it did seem, at least from our conversation, I don't think the committee ever took a vote, that when you look at it as you described it, that the interoperability, the revenue ability, the sponsorship ability, it seemed like Hubway was the most appropriate choice. And am I understanding that MAPC is assisting communities with, with the Hubway? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and we, we've been in, in touch with them to indicate our interest in learning more about it. Thank you. Can I take that also as a motion to receive? I move to receive. Okay, is there a second? Second. Mr. Dunn, Mr. Dunn. Um, thank you for the, for the presentation. It was indeed very interesting. Uh, I'm, um, so I guess I, what I'm, the thing that I'm most interested in, I think that it wasn't there that I'm curious about, is in, what is there information available that talks about how towns like Arlington get integrated into a network like Hubway? So Arlington is a very dense town, but we're less dense than Cambridge or Boston. And uh, I'm curious with other cities or even other towns on the Hubway system, what was it like when they started penetrating you know, the less dense towns like us? And how long does it take for it to work? Or and does it work in the long run? And so, I mean, the two that I, systems that I use the most are um, here in our Hubway in Boston and uh, Bixie in um, Montreal. <coughs> and those are all, like, I, I use those, like, I've used the Alewife Hubway station, but by far the vast majority of stuff that I've used Hubway for is actually in Boston itself. Mm -hmm. And I own a bike. And so, you know, would I, like, how much would I use Hubway and how long? And, and at the same time, if we say, you know, East Arlington, dense, very dependent on public transportation relative to other parts of the town, you know, there are five stations there and that's totally, we can make that totally viable and that's the way, and we should, and that, like, I'd like, like, like that's a pot, totally I could imagine that. I could also imagine someone saying, it's never gonna work in Arlington, you're too dense, we've tried it before. And I would curious what uh, data is out there. I'm actually, sorry, oh, sorry. I am generally very supportive. I would love it, but, <laughs> oh, but I would love to see some data just to make sure that I believe that it isn't just the you know, hope, hope versus fact. I'd love to have some facts too. Yeah. Mr. Bunn. Yeah, so uh, again, thank you very much. I, I guess I, I am, you know, coming into this, I, I was obviously, you know, leaning more heavily towards Hubway um, in my own thoughts, and I, I'm pretty sure I still am. I'm very curious to see what the um, what the Vision 2020 survey has to say. Um, I, I mean, I, I'd just be curious, you know, is, is, like Dan was saying, this is, you know, primarily used in, uh, you know, the city where people, you know, go very short routes. And, and I'd be curious to know if our residents would, you know, want to use it for those short routes or are they looking for more leisurely rides um, up and down the bike path? Um, 
you know, I, I agree with Joe that it probably doesn't make sense if it's just us in Lexington because it's pretty, um, you know, that's, you know, th that could, I guess I see them as two completely separate networks and I, I'm curious to know which one that Arlington residents would utilize most. Um, for the expansion uh, of Hubway, not so much how Dan's question on how it comes, you know, into a community like Arlington, but say we opened up with one or two um, stations, would it be, you know, easy to expand? Or do we have to wait until the next operating contract is up to try to get those um, additional stations put in the community? I can double check, but I, I don't believe that we do. I think if you have the capital, you, you can, can just do it anytime. I mean, I, I work in Cambridge, um, and they've steadily added systems over the course of the life, and it's, it's really just about getting the capital in place and then gotcha. so we look, having it delivered. Well, that makes sense. So now this is our... So once you're in, you're in, and you can right. buy as much as you want. Right. I think I think the key around this, um, the current contract negotiation is the sponsorship, sponsorship solicitation, and particularly for the title sponsor. So mm -hmm. the title sponsor will want to know how many bikes and how many stations are there to put my name on in a given mm -hmm. community. And so if it's only two, then that would. It, incur a different level of interest than if it's five. That makes sense. Oh. Um, are you done, Mr. Wayne? Um, yeah, uh, one, um, yeah I'm, I'm excited about where this is going. I, I do think that Hubway would be a, a great addition. Um, I was happy to see that there's potential to make money off it. I, I actually wasn't expecting that coming into it. Um, so, so that was um, you know, welcome news. So I think this will, be, uh, this will be cool, and thank you for all your work. Yeah, I had one more question on the on the sponsorships. Um, does Hubway itself um, try to engage sponsors, or are participating communities on the hook? Yeah. So under the new contract, Hubway itself or Motivate the operator will actively seek out sponsors, um, particularly the title sponsor. They do take a cut of that. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's between ten and twenty percent, but. Part of their contract is to s solicit the sponsorship. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong. So there's the big name title sponsor, yep. but then it is also possible to get sponsors for like individual stations that could be solicited totally separately. Absolutely. And so the the numbers that I showed you were assuming that we did both of those. Right. Um, and so I think we can for the local sponsors we could do that independently, and then motivate wouldn't take any piece of that. Um, or I think they're also open to helping with that, um, and they certainly have you know promotional material that we can use to help educate local businesses about the benefits of becoming a sponsor. Uh, just a few questions, um, just showing my naivete. Like when I when I go into Boston downtown, you know Levitt Circle, and I'm going past Mass General, Cambridge Street, I see a big long. Is that um, Hubway? It is at the MGH station. Yeah. Okay. And, um, my other question is, when I see that, and I think I heard you say that each station is 40 feet long, are you bound to that? Are they collapsible? Could we, do you have to do the whole 40 feet? I'm thinking if it's something like, you know, the bikeway, yes, but if you're talking about perhaps some of these other sites, or sites people are gonna mention in the future that we haven't even considered. Right, so um, the station is modular um, in 10 bike units. So the standard 40 foot station is two 10 bike units put together plus the kiosk. Um, so yes, you could have a smaller station. Um, you don't want to get too small because then you have not very many bikes and not very many docks to put bikes um, when they're being used. Mm -hmm. um, the other consideration is that most of the station cost is in the kiosk. So you don't, it's not like getting a 10 bike station <coughs> is half the cost of a 20 bike station. Um, but it's certainly possible to have smaller stations um, so if, you know, we wanted to, for example, expand out more into the neighborhoods, I could see that being a, a case for a, a s some of the smaller stations. Mm -hmm. um, so it's certainly an option. And then alternatively, you can also go the other way. And um, I'm struggling to come up with an example downtown, but there are, you know, South there are station. 40 bike stations downtown. Yeah, South Station. Yeah, of, of course, right. South Station, North Station um, have, have some much larger stations, and they can be configured and just in linearly, but they can also be opposite. So depending on the space that you have for the station, they have different configurations. Yeah, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself just in terms of 
I just wanted to know if, know if we were stuck to that 40 foot, no matter what. I'm just thinking of where some of the suggestions might come in. And I assume it's going to be the planning department and not ABAC that after they gather all the information, as best as you can, can sort of do a projected, not supply and demand, but if you could come up with sites, I'm assuming there'd be some data around that of what you project a possible user group would be in terms of numbers or, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yes, and, and I think that actually ties in with what Mr. Dunn said, that okay. we, if, if I may, I think what we, I think what we want tonight is to say, you know, see, see what the board's pulse is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is it worth pursuing? Uh, if it's break even, near break even, or maybe, maybe if we don't, you know, meet break even, is it something that we think we want to put the capital up front for? And then if that's the yes, then I think we go back to work. Um, I don't see us asking for any resources at the Springtown meeting, uh, but maybe later in the year or next year. And that's when we start to look at, you know, with a, with a thumbs up tonight, I think we start to look at the question, that exact question. Right. Who, who would use this? How would they use it? How does it connect to Cambridge? How does it connect to Somerville? What are Medford and Belmont doing? You know, is there, is there interoperability that makes sense there? Um, to answer just that question. Okay. You know, who are, who are these people that, you know, you know, is it Mr. Dunn who already has the, the tag, or is it somebody else <coughs> who, you know, doesn't use it now because they don't necessarily, they're not near a station, but if they were, they would utilize it. And then, um, and I'm certainly in favor of going forward to it on this. I, I wouldn't myself personally commit to um, authorizing 246000 or any of the other yeah. things. I don't think I'm hearing that right now. I'm not asking for that. And yet. then the only other thing I would just um, ask is if there's any way, and there's a great universe with the Vision 2020 survey, but I'm thinking in terms of um, where like-minded constituencies or communities might exist that we could also reach out to. One with um, suggestion for if we do move forward with some model, which I'm leaning towards Hubway, um, suggestions from sort of that user group or groups. And then the second thing is on the sponsorship um, aspect of it, which I'm very interested in. So is there any way, I, I guess I would ask the town manager to explore, A, is there any way we can get someone or all of the Vision 2020 survey questions, if perhaps you could have a conversation with Superintendent Bodie? Um, maybe something else that she's comfortable with or just maybe something she can say that surveys out there, look for, for Vision 2020, because so many of our schools have an active constituency, safe routes and um, I, th I don't think we have, a, I'm not sure if it, every school I go to, middle school, high school, elementary, I've seen bike racks. So if you can just explore if there's any um, way we can, um, without violating any school policies, even if it's to say, draw the attention to the survey out there. And then the second would be, just to put it on the table as a suggestion, especially where you're talking about sponsorships and I'm thinking about town day and some other things like that. Um, perhaps communicating with the Chamber of Commerce so they're aware of it. I just don't want um, that if we move along and we commit to, you know, Greater Boston Motorsports is going to sponsor something somewhere and we have an Arlington business that says, you know, not only would I have done that, I'm the same kind of business, but, you know, you're basically, I have my competition advertising in my face, you know. So some sort of reach out to the uh, Chamber of Commerce and whatever Absolutely. you can get from the yeah. schools. Mr. Dunn? Just one th thing about Hubway that's a feature that's worth pointing out is the app. That, so you always know where the nearest station is and how many spaces or bikes are available. That's all. And just to add to that, so Zagster has an app, but they don't show you how many bikes are available at the stations. Wow. I wish I could ride my bicycle with my... 45 pounds of equipment yeah. <laughs> but I'm too <laughs> but anyways um so I think what we're hearing right now is Mr. Kiro made a motion to receive and it was Second. seconded by Mr. Byrne I think we're also hearing inherent on that is that we, you know we appreciate the report and, the, and what you're about to embark on and ideally you know within the next six to twelve months the probably <coughs> We anticipate some pretty uh, solid recommendations, and it could be a fourth option or something else. But th yep. th I think that's the timeline we're operating under here. So, um, so I just want to make sure just receiving the report is appropriate. That is fun, yeah. Okay. Um, any further questions? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, unanimous vote. 
Mr. Chapdelaine, approval, Minuteman bike. Thank you, Seth, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feel better. Thank you for Thank coming you. out. <laughs> no Don't problem. cough on the manager. We need him yeah. for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> um, agenda item seven, approval, Minuteman bikeway, 25th anniversary committee roster, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, several meetings ago, the board authorized the creation of a 25th anniversary committee to celebrate the 20, uh, 25th anniversary of the Minuteman bikeway. And part of that vote was to bring back a proposed slate to make up that committee uh, to, uh, to the board for approval. So that's what this is. Uh, the memo also has um, a little bit of narrative and a schedule about um, anticipated uh, goals and meeting times or the meeting schedule of the, of the committee. But I'd be happy to answer any questions, but otherwise would look forward to the board's approval of the roster so they can get to work. Is there Mr. Kiro? Although I have some hesitations about the first name on the list. <laughs> I know. Who is that <laughs> shady guy? I move approval. Moved by Mr. Carroll, seconded by? Second. Mr. Byrne, uh, any further discussion? I'm um, going to vote yes, even though I'm on the list. <laughs> How'd you get first, buddy? But anyways. Alphabetical. <laughs> and it's a Smart committee of a very uh, well-assembled committee of 11 people, and we certainly appreciate everything moving forward on that. And thank goodness you're doing it, and I don't have to. <laughs> On a motion by Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. Byrne, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. We now go to Mr. Chapdelaine, approval Lake Street Bikeway Design Review Committee roster. Uh, very similar request. Uh, at a past board meeting, the board did approve for TAC and DPW via engineering to move forward with beginning the design of signalization at the Lake Street and Minuteman Bikeway intersection. Uh, at that time, TAC had advised that the creation of a design review committee uh, or that we create a design review committee so that there could be members of the public, departmental representation, and also the ability to have a committee structure to hold some public meetings to review the designs as they go forward. Uh, tax leadership recommended a committee make up in terms of where we should get representatives from. We polled all of those groups for who they would like to have designated to the design review committee. Those names are before you. And again, um, would very much like the board's approval so that we can get to work on this, um, this design. Move approval. Moved by Mr. Dunn, seconded by. Second. I, I have a question yeah. as well. And did you say TAC recommended these um, groups for the committee? They did, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? Uh, just two thoughts, I, which I know you're on top of, but I'm going to say them anyway. Okay. Uh, this is going to be controversial. And so uh, <laughs> getting as many neighbors involved in, in as, as we can and as early and as in many ways if we can if you can help the committee do that i think that'll be really important for the long run uh and i know it's a little bit co coincidental but when we were up at the state house for the complete streets award this intersection actually came up uh like in some of the hobnobby conversations you know that happened really? before the, uh, the the thing actually started and uh i was talking we were talking about it and i said yeah we're gonna and there was definitely they were, they were the, the people that I was talking to were marveling at the idea of trying to signalize an intersection like that. And they were, and I said, but Lexington does it exactly like that. Yeah. And I said, yeah, but Arlington's different. And so I think that I'd be curious if we talked to the state a little bit about, um, to see if they have any resources, because I think they clearly are struggling with this in other places. Yeah. And so they, they're, they're, I think there's some expertise there that we can probably talk to. Yeah, all right. Okay, um, any further discussion? My colleagues, motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Agenda item nine, discussion. Treasurer collector position. As we all know. Uh, you got quite the rundown of me here. No, yeah, talk, talking to the board. I was going to say, uh, something that uh, <coughs> many of us have been talking about, uh, the town manager asked to place this on the agenda, so I guess I'll turn to you first, Mr. Chaplain. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So. Uh, as the board knows, and I think most of the, the, the public has probably become aware, our long-serving treasurer, former board of selectmen, former conservation commissioner, town meeting member, among other, uh, or other service to the, the town of Arlington, Steve Gilligan, has announced he's not seeking re-election for the treasurer collector position. Um, uh, you, you, even though there's been some you know, past discussions about the status of that position, we'll say, between uh, myself and Steve and others, um, you know, very, very sad to see Steve go. Uh, definitely grown quite fond of him over the years. Uh, and certainly his dedication and his passion for the town of Arlington. So um, certainly wish him very, very well in his retirement. Um, that said, uh, I did want to immediately start the conversation and at least tonight have a, pr a preliminary discussion with the Board of Selectmen to, again, 
similar to bike share, take the pulse of the Board of Selectmen of uh, once again pursuing the professionalization of the treasurer collector's position, which could lead to the creation of um, a finance department for the town of Arlington uh, that would have multiple finance officers directed by a finance director, most likely uh, embodied by the deputy town manager. Um, there's a probably a significantly long path to that that would take a discussion at town meeting and a vote at town meeting and then eventually a ballot question uh, to uh, transition any elected position to an appointed position. Um, so I think I'm here tonight saying that's something I'm still interested in pursuing, uh, but uh, very much interested in hearing the board's um, thoughts and feedback on that. To give us all time to contemplate whether or not there's any warrant articles we want to file by the warrant article filing deadline at the end of this month and possibly discuss them further at the January 23rd meeting. Mr. Carroll. Uh, thank you. Um, I, thank you, Mr. Manager. Um, I think this is a very opportune time to, to bring this discussion back again. You know, we get the regular DOR um, e-newsletters uh, sent to us, and, and we see this continuing trend towards, um, <clears throat> you know, professional appointed finance uh, directors and other communities um, in the Commonwealth. And I think that, unfortunately, um, th this has been a very, to be quite frank, I mean, I think that this has been a difficult de debate in the past when we've had this discussion B because the, the um, you know, our current treasurer has, has uh, given so much in public service to the town, and I think, unfortunately, it got a little bit tangled up between the, the issue of, of, of appointment and, and uh, you know, the value that we place on, on the treasurer's uh, many years of service uh, to the town. I, I think it does make sense to, to revisit this at, at this point. We have a, a perfect opportunity um, to, um, to go back to town meeting and uh, discuss it. We've had a few more years, um, you know, under our belt, um, and certainly you were in the difficult position, not to put you on the spot, of yeah. being brand new in, in the uh, town manager's role when we first brought this um, the, this uh, to, to town meeting uh, for, for discussion. And um, I, th I think, um, <clears throat> you know, working against that, um, you know, the experience you've attained, and also knowing what major financing um, challenges we have going forward with some of the major capital projects and school projects and such. It's it really is an opportune time to um, to uh, bring this this up again. So uh, I, for one, you know, I'd like to hear what the rest of my colleagues have to say. But I, for one, I'd be happy to see us put this on the on the warrant again, so that we can have the discussion once more, um, you know, in town meeting and see if there is a, a renewed uh, appetite for. For, um, for approaching it. And I, I will say um, I've had a couple of conversations recently and in the past uh, with the town manager. Um, again, since we have this opportunity in terms of, you know, uh, Mr. Gilligan retiring after so many years, as well as on the school side, we have the school CFO position. Um, I did ask the manager when he does present something um, I asked him to present my short brief synopsis is when we, you know, first started down this road, it sort of was the tale of two audits. And from what came out of that, and I know Mr. Carmen, I know you were there at town meeting, I think Mr. Rudiman was, and what happened after that was, you know, uh, I had met with Mr. Sullivan and basically was saying, you know, what is it that you're concerned about from that? A decision was made when I expressed the concerns about having town school finances coordinated, including even using the MUNA system, which the town does, and um, the schools might now with the person that's filling in. Um, I did ask the manager that when we went out, commissioned the report from the DOR, there were like seven or 10 tenants or steps that said, okay, if you wanna have a town school, I'm encapsulating it, town school finance department, whatever, these are the seven or 10 steps you would need to do, and three of them were um, steps you would need to take on the school side. And then there was a big long discussion. M my frustration was that report that was done for one purpose that really came from the two different audits, um, one area got focused on, first it was two areas, elect, no more elected board of assessors, no more elected uh, treasurer, and then assessors got taken off the table. So I did ask the manager if he could, and he has electronically emailed it to me also, 
Um, if we could somehow get back, since we, in my opinion, we, and I'm not saying it isn't anybody else's, we do have an opportune um, t uh, time on the town and school side with two different transitions, that if we can relook at that whole report, uh, if the manager could put it for us, before us in some form, with the caveat that he may say, okay, Mrs. Mahan, you asked me to put forth on all seven points or, or the three school points, I don't support it, <laughs> but you know, um, here's what it is. Or, because um, I'd like to do the whole thing um, as much as we can. You can't do anything specifically um, to, to every minute detail, um, but I'd, I'd like to, and it'd be interesting to hear, you know, as, as the uh, campaign season evolves, you know, where anybody else is thinking of that. But we have the school CFO who is moving on to another position. I'm told by the town manager and Mr. Greco and Mr. Viscay that the person who's filling in for us, and I keep saying, I know her name is Tony, and I can't think of her last name, but she's really done a, a, a very good job. So I'm anticipating if we looked at if this is six to 12 months down the road solution. <clears throat> um, so I just wanted to let my colleagues know that, that I've had that conversation you know, with the town manager. So I did ask him to put forth, recognizing that I just may be the only woman on the island, and you know that's okay. And then I just want to pass on, um, with um, Mr. Gilligan retiring and p different people um, hearing about this agenda item, I heard from probably 18, 22 people over the course of the past week, um, mostly like Dunkin' Donuts and places like that, that, oh, you're gonna talk about the treasurer position again, you have to go to the voters before you do that. Yeah, yeah. Of course. So, and I've told them, unless I'm losing my mind, yes, we do. So I just wanted to say that that's a point that's been raised, and I've told them, you know, this would be a step-by-step -step process. So I'm certainly in favor of uh, moving forward. I just don't wanna rush anything um, in terms of if, for some reason we all agree and we want to take a majority of that DOR report. I understand doing step by step, but my thing is we've had this around for so long, what the impetus for that actual conversation and uh, study was, if we can you know, move on more things, if not all. It, recognizing they may say that you know, treasure is gonna take six to 15 months, depending on election, depending on the ballot question. Uh, a school thing may take six to 24 months. Um, you know, yeah. I just kind of like to, uh, I, I know I probably confused what I tried to say, but I just want to make sure you're all cognizant of the conversations I had with the manager. Um, Mr. Byrne. Um, thanks. Um, one, of course, you know, thank uh, Mr. Gilligan for all his service to the town. He's obviously been around for a while and um, I, I think we're all indebted to him for, for that service. Um, Adam, I do have a couple um, questions. Um, how's it been going since the Director of Assessments has um, you know, moved under kind of your jurisdiction, and, and what's changed? Um, frankly, uh, it, it's hard to pinpoint um, exactly what's changed. Uh, you know, I, we had a very good working relationship with Paul Tierney, who's the Director of Assessing uh, under the direction of the Board of Assessors. Uh, we now maintain that. Uh, I went down maybe two two months ago now to sit with the Board of Assessors, and we came with a, I, no, no votes were taken. I think we left that meeting with a common agreement of what their responsibilities were uh, statutorily as an elected Board of Assessors, and then what the Director of Assessment's responsibilities would be in reporting to the town manager. So um, I suppose that the difference um, has been that we just articulated who's responsible for what in mm -hmm. a different way. Uh, I think it would be a good question to ask Paul how he feels mm -hmm. about having uh, a day-to-day -day supervisor in the building that he can go to with questions, concerns, problems, whatever it might be, um, as opposed to um, as opposed to an, a board that's not necessarily there all the time. But I, I wouldn't suppose to answer that question for Paul. But I think that would be a, a as this process goes forward, that would be a mm -hmm. good question to ask Paul Tierney. No, that's uh, good. No, and I, I will bring that up with Paul. Um, with the uh, timeline that you laid out, how would that interact with the election for Steve, or for Mr. Gilligan's seat? I think no matter how we look at this, that is potentially problematic. Um, even in the tightest of timelines, which would probably have us moving faster than I would imagine any of us have the appetite to move, would be putting a question on this April's annual town election, that would still have 
another election for treasurer on that ballot. So there's no way around having a ballot question before somebody is presumably, or multiple people are on the ballot for treasurer. Um, so that, that's a challenge. That said, um, the way the statute currently reads, if a town chooses to move to <clears throat> an appointed position, uh, whoever is the current elected treasurer, collector at that time, um, serves in that position through the end of that elected term. So just hypothetically speaking, someone gets elected this April, um, process is set in motion to create an appointed position, doesn't go on the ballot until April of 2018, it uh, succeeds in becoming uh, an appointed position on that ballot, the person who becomes treasurer collector this April still serves out the remaining two years of the term as treasurer, as treasurer collector. I should uh, also point out uh, the statute's very clear um, a ballot question uh, for this this matter can only be on an annual town election. It can't be a special town election. It can't be put on a state election. Hmm. It has to be put on an annual town election ballot. Hmm. Interesting. That is an interesting court. Um, no. Um, okay, thank you. So I, I think back when, you know, I, th I think it was my first, probably one of my first committees I, I was put on was to... Um, Move this to a you know full-time um, appointed position, and, and and it's something I, I do believe, and I, I think for the for the sake of the office, um, you know we've been lucky to have strong candidates. Um, I think you know potentially expanding the candidate pool for such an important position is the right step to take. Um, and to I, I think Steve uh, has hired some uh, you know tremendous people down there. And, you know, I would hate to lose the, you know, institutional knowledge, say, of some of his higher ranking, um, you know, people that work for him um, that might leave town because they wouldn't have the ability to be in that role. Um, so, you know, th that's a, a lot of things that I, I'm thinking right now. The timeline, um, I think it could be a bit confusing having an election for a treasurer and language concerning the seat on the same ballot, but you know, I guess that's something I would have to think about moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Kerr, did you have your hand up or? Well, I think Mr. Have Dunn you, Have you gone yet? Okay, I Mr. Dunn, I apologize. Yeah, no problem. Um, thank you. Uh, I also th uh, thank Mr. Gilligan for his service. He's, uh, and uh, I think that um, I definitely support you going forward and looking at changing uh, the the role of the position making it uh, <coughs> profession uh, making it professionalized i think that uh, since that consultant's report came out i think things have changed you know in as you know time goes by and not only in, in people change roles change the town change and we also explicitly made some changes especially related to the assessors already uh, and i think that we definitely did get bogged down the last time we talked about this in some of it became personality and some of it was like ego and those things were challenges in terms of us getting the right thing done. <clears throat> and we definitely should take this opportunity to uh, move forward when, we, uh, when we're, we're not entirely free of it, because just because as you say, there's gonna be an election no matter what. And, you know, and so I know um, I'm definitely, uh, so I, uh, Dean Carmen who's in the audience has taken out papers and he's told me that one of the things he wants to do is to run as treasurer such that he can, uh, Help us find our way on that, and he would could support an outcome where you know where we would, and so that would be to me that's the type of thing that would be helpful because it would allow us to have the conversation without being encumbered um, in that way. So uh, I think we should look at their past conversations, and we should take the parts that make sense, and we should try to move them forward. And I think it is an excellent time to do it. Thank you, Mr. Kiro. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to say, uh, you know, <clears throat> in reference to some of the things that the, the, the chair has said, that I, I think this is a, an opportunity to, to bring, bring forward the, the package that was there, as long as we can, you know, uh, pass individual pieces. You know, it, it's possible that certain pieces won't gain traction, but um, I believe I was chair of the school committee at the time that, that the original proposal came forward and it was the Barnstable model, which was the, um, <clears throat> the uh, combined uh, municipal finance uh, department. I, I spoke to the, the officials in Barnstable um, at, at the time and they were very pleased um, 
with the way that the, the consolidated uh, finance department um, had, had worked uh, for them. And I think that um, things do change. And at the time that the proposal first came forward, uh, again, in all frankness, I think there were some significant tensions between this board and, and the, um, the school committee, and there wasn't as much, um, I think, maybe openness to, to pursue it. I think there's concern about losing um, independent budgetary authority, which cannot happen. Statutorily cannot, cannot, will not um, happen for the school committee. But I, I think it's worth reaching out to our friends uh, at, on the, the committee and seeing if there might be an openness at this, at this point towards pursuing that piece of a, of a finance department as well. I think we've, we've proven over the last few years an excellent ability to work together in uh, addressing the enrollment um, challenges that, that, that we faced. Uh, in adjusting some of the financing uh, formulas in our five-year plan. I think we've, we've actually done a pretty good job of, of working together, and there may be openness to that conversation if, if it's coupled with, you know, reinsurances that that, that, that type of uh, that budgetary autonomy within the school department uh, would be maintained. I think we also have to be open to other parts of the, the proposal as well, which I, I believe included considering rolling the, the comptroller into the, the um, consolidated finance department a, as well. And, um, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, when, when we hired our excellent comptroller, I know that the town manager's office, in particular the deputy town manager, did a lot of that vetting and the professional vetting for, for that role. And I understand the reasons that, that that also didn't pass. But I think if we're going to have the conversation. Why don't we revisit the conversation and all its constituent pieces? I agree. And um, I, two <coughs> things. First, uh, Mr. Cure, I'm certainly buoyed by your remarks. And I would like to, if I could, with my colleague's permission as chair, um, impart upon you the task of beginning outreach to our colleagues on the school committee and or perhaps with the town manager and, and Superintendent Bodie, the four of you, or whether it's a uh, speaker phone conference, I'm not trying to make more meetings or anything like that to you, but to basically kind of um, lay the groundwork um, for that to, to happen in the future. In terms of uh, the election in April, and it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm also on the ballot, not running for treasurer, um, and, and um, putting something on the ballot to the voters, I agree with what I heard from the town manager that having those two issues on, appointed or not, appointed or elected, as well as person or persons running for that would be confusing, but even more so, um, piggybacking on all of my colleagues' comments, especially with the DOR report, I think we need to do some education out there, because I would like, um, if we go to an appointed treasurer, which, which is the way I'm um, leaning right now, that it's a pretty um, definitive vote. You know, I, I, I would hate to see the community split, you know, 4951 or anything like that. And so I think there needs to be education. And lastly, I think another reason not to have both those issues on this annual town election, um, I think residents and department heads and others will get a sense from this board um, the way that we're leaning. Um, I'm honestly not sure if anybody else besides Mr. Carmen Dean has taken out papers, but if there are, there is another person that says, hey, this is kind of unfair, you know, I'm running on a different platform than you all are discussing, and, you know, so I, I think it's good to separate in terms of having enough time for the education to follow up on. Um, it, it, we may find from Mr. Kiro or Mr. Chapdelaine that um, the current school committee, which has some people who were on it when the DOR report ca came out, has, has said, I'm certainly willing to, you know, I agree with these three points, but I only agree with one of the recommendations and how we get there. So for all those reasons, I just would say if I had my druthers not to, to definitely put something forth to town meeting and you can, if you think you have enough time for January 23rd, but I think we have quite a few things, but actually you would have to because the 29th is um, the last deadline. The selectmen, of course, can put something in right up until 20 days before the Warren has to go out. Or in 27th is the deadline for um, right. 
But if, okay, yeah, so we can get it in even even if we haven't decided, we right. can still put it on the warrant. Right. So I, I anticipate. Does that sound? Is that what you were looking for? Yes. That we've had this initial conversation, and then um, is it something that you want to put? before town meeting, you want the Board of Selectmen, you want a combination thereof, or you want to think about it and tell us on January 23rd? Um, so you, the board has definitely given me what I was looking for tonight in terms of a response and, and where, your, where your heads or where your thoughts are at on the matter. Um, in terms of filing a warrant article, let me think about whether or not it should be inserted by the Board of Selectmen or at the request of the town manager. Let me, let me think about how that is best handled. Mm -hmm. And whatever you decide, it's no, territorial <coughs> issue or yeah. anything. Yeah. I just want to get the conversation as we all do um, started in before town meeting in the proper venue. So we don't necessarily need to have any kind of vote on that. I don't that. think so. Okay. Is there anyone here that wanted to say anything? No. Okay. Um, now we will go to agenda item 10, discussion, recreational marijuana. Uh, Mr. Chapterline and I have had conversations about this and um, I know he and Attorney Heim have been um, doing some investigation on this, so I'm gonna start with Mr. Chapterling. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, so as you just mentioned, there's been uh, interest from uh, board members, from the public, uh, from town uh, departments in regards to uh, the, the recently passed recreational marijuana ballot question, its impacts on the town, and whether or not the town wants to contemplate um, pursuing a ballot question to opt out of allowing recreational marijuana in Arlington. Uh, so. Uh, I definitely was going to rely on Attorney Heim tonight, but um, <clears throat> we d talked today and I wanted to be able to provide the board um, sort of the, the framework of what um, we think the board should be thinking about. And again, not asking for any vote tonight, but something for consideration, perhaps a little discussion and then maybe a vote or not um, in the future. So the ballot question passed, um, and as the board may know, uh, the legislature just recently uh, passed an extension of when the Cannabis Control Commission would start uh, accepting applications till April 1st of 2018. So there's a little more time for cities and towns to consider what it wants to do. The statute also allows for, and this is where it gets a little tricky, adopting an ordinance or bylaw by a vote or voters of the city or town to prohibit uh, recreational mm -hmm. marijuana. So there's a little, um, I guess there's a little disagreement in the, the municipal legal community that adopting a bylaw or ordinance uh, carries a different legal significance than by a vote of the voters. Uh, so currently, I think the leading opinion is that a ballot question um, is the way to do this. That would then have to be followed up most likely by a bylaw, um, uh, banning it or opting out of allowing recreational marijuana. Uh, and also the leading opinion is that it would not have to be a zoning bylaw uh, because zoning bylaw doesn't necessarily tie in with that type of language, it would more, more than likely be a general bylaw. Uh, a lot of that is still being worked out, and I would imagine that the state will be coming out with some guidance, or hoping that the state will be coming out with some guidance on how they exactly want municipalities to do this, to limit the opportunity for challenges. So I, I think what, um, what I wanted uh, the board to begin to think about is whether or not uh, it was interested in placing a ballot question. Um, um, on the ballot to, to, to poll the community on whether or not it actually wanted recreational marijuana in Arlington. Um, I know one of the, the previous speakers tonight, uh, I think very accurately said that there is a difference between voting for something because you think it's a good idea and then voting for something that might be in your backyard. Um, so I think that that is a, a worthwhile thing for the board, um, for the board to think about. I'll also say, um, my recollection is that medicinal or medical marijuana passed by a larger margin in Arlington than recreational marijuana did. Um, but even with that significant margin that I, I, I recall medical marijuana passing by, uh, it has created a lot of concern in the community that there are there is a facility planning to locate um, in the community. So um, again, just, just giving you some of my thoughts, I think it, it, it does at least raise in my mind the question of whether or not a ballot question would be, or could be, the right thing to do to see how Arlington really feels about having a facility in Arlington. So again, um, that's a pretty brief just overview of what I th believe the town um, can consider doing to opt out of recreational marijuana. I'm not asking for a vote tonight, but any questions you have, if I don't have the answers, I can find the answers, and then again, we can come back at a future meeting to deliberate. And just a procedural, <coughs> um, are we thinking probably by the January 23rd meeting? 
We couldn't do it in we, February, right? We could. Um, you mean in terms of time to get it on a, on the on the ballot? Um, we would have to do it by the January twenty third meeting. Yes. And then if we didn't, we'd we be forced to have a, a special election and another one before the next annual. Well, no, it would have to. Okay, forget it. I'm, I'm just thinking, uh, Mr. Kiro, and then Mr. Byrne. Yeah, I'm just looking for clarification, Mr. Manager, on on one of the things you said. You said it's a, a bylaw or ordinance to prohibit recreational marijuana. Do you mean to prohibit the sale, don't you? Y yes, yeah, it's excuse me, yeah, a facility, yes, a marijuana establishment, it seems to be called. Marijuana establishment, okay. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm glad you raised that, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, everything, nothing that we're talking about has any impact on the new laws uh, legalizing possession by persons over 21 and legalized home cultivation of up to 12 plants. That is not affected okay. by either this ballot question or the extension of the bill. That is legal today. Okay, I think that's, that's a very, Sorry. very important distinction. Um, and I'll just say, <coughs> from, from my own <coughs> point of view, I think it makes sense to go to the referendum. And I'll, I'll say that I don't think there are many people who are uh, you know, arguing to go back to prohibition of alcohol, but still, you know, in this community, whenever we have expanded um, the retail outlets for wine and beer or, or all alcohol sales, we have gone to the voters and, and, and um, sought their, um, their assent. Um, and um, I don't know if they've ever turned it down. Uh, Not on. I don't believe so. But but um, we, we have gone to the voters, and I, I think that this is consistent with that um, with that precedent. Even though it, it sounds like we have to word it the other way, correct? We have to word it. Are you in favor of prohibition? Yes. This is an op. <clears throat> this is a negative as opposed to an affirmative yeah. positioning. So that that's my at first blush. That's that's my my thinking. Mr. Byrne? Um, can this be on any election, or is it a biennial town election? For some reason, reading the language, I thought it, had, it, could only, it couldn't be this year. Um, that's just, and I don't know that for sure, but I, I thought when I read the language, it was like, it was worded funny. Hmm. Um, yeah. but, so, but you mean only every other town election? I, that's what I, when I first read it. On a state election, it has to be. Thank you. Um, and if it's impossible, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like. To, I think we should look at the timing of when it can actually take place. Yeah, um, I will look at that. I mean, it very well may say a state election, but the next state election is not is after the deadline to open up. To, to I, I don't think that was done um, <laughs> unintentionally. Yeah, unintentionally. Um, but we, it's something that that you should look into. Um, and if I remember correctly, it's two uh, towns can have 20% of liquor license. Uh, you can have, so we could have one potential recreational marijuana place in town um, due to what our five liquor stores are and one potential recreational um, marijuana store. And, you know, I think one thing that we have to look, look at moving forward and, and, you know, we don't know what the law is going to look like in another six months. Um, right. You know, it, it could change, you know, in in many ways, um, small ways or, or big ways, um, you know, we have to look at whether state law um, overrules our special permit that says it can only be a recreational marijuana facility, um, and, and that's something I think we have to follow pretty closely. It says it can only be a medical. Because our, our special yeah. permit says it can only be a medical marijuana facility, yeah. but we we don't know if that will actually stick um, after you know this law moves forward. Um, so, so there, there are a lot of things that I think we, we have to pay um, pretty close attention to. Um, and and I, when it comes to, to putting it on, on the ballot again, part of me does feel like it was just on the ballot. Um, we, we, we just voted on it. And, and I can see the, the, you know, I can see a potential difference. But I, I'm, you know, I, I don't feel terribly strongly against putting on the ballot, but I do think that we have to be ready for if it passes, there will be another application here probably the next day. And I don't think that that's incredibly unlikely, that you know the voters will vote to support it. And um, then at, at that point, I, th I think our, our doors just open pretty widely. Um, so I think in, in making this decision, and I don't know how uh, uh, you know, if this does come before us again, I, I don't know how I'd vote on it, but 
there's a lot of things that, that we should consider and the, you know, a lot of externalities that, that this could cause. So mm -hmm. thank you. For my comments, um, try to be brief because I said tonight I was gonna be brief by the fact of how long a day it would be. Uh, number one, I'm all for um, going to the voters um, on, on this particular item. But in terms of timing, um, I would pose to the manager, um, I believe from the information that I have before me, and correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> it says that in order for the town of Arlington to limit the number of marijuana dispensers to less than 20% of the number of liquor licenses, this is from the Beacon, I'm not doing this off the top of my head, um, in order to limit to that model, that would mean we would only have one in town that um, the uh, need to have that limit or ban, 20% of liquor sales, so we only have one, has to be approved by a vote of the voters. Am I misconstruing that information in there? No, I think that's what we're talking about, that it would have to be a ballot question. Uh, but what I'm saying is, do we have to do that ballot question anyways if the board, when there's a full board here, says we want to keep it so that we can apply that 20% of liquor licenses? So there would, it, say, say, playing devil's advocate, and someone saying, you know, we're going to have that 20% of liquor sales because the voters, oh, the voters already voted that, so we don't have to vote that. What I'm saying is I was so confused by the things that the state agency took in and took out. So when I read this thing in the beacon, I thought I was saying we have to do that again. We don't. M Mr. Sullivan? No, I believe that the 20% the is already allowed. That would be the max cap if we don't do anything. Okay. And it's a, it stated liquor licenses. Package store or all? Because we have 36. Mm -hmm. Right. Roughly yeah. all, yeah. or five package stores. Which one? I'm just curious. From yeah, the liquor ministry. stores. Uh, my understanding it was package stores. Yes. Package stores. Yeah. yes. Okay. All right. But uh, again, anticipating maybe January 20. Well, um, Mr. Dunn, I'm sorry. Uh, it's. I'm, I'm definitely. So I hadn't actually. I hadn't heard about the opt out till today. I didn't actually. And then I, I believe I got an email saying that there's an opt out, and I sent an email to Doug, and Doug was homesick. Uh, so I am very curious about mm -hmm. the details about this. But if it, you know, if the earliest we can legally do this is November 18, it's kind of premature to put it on the, for us to talk about it uh, in November. So I'm, I'm not in a particular <coughs> rush uh, because I, I, I fe it feel, it feels <coughs> like, uh, and, and say like you know they, they're taking applications on April 1st of 2018. Mm -hmm. If we hold our vote on April you know 3rd of 2018. That you know, even, even if it turns out to be ta town manageable, we're going to be able to do our will at that point too. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not, I don't currently see an urgency. If someone explains to me that there is urgency, I'm happy to hear it, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, no, I think I think that's fair. I, I'm I'm not sure that it is limited to a state election. Even that that language that um, the chair was just reading from and Marianne just shared with me does talk about some communities that have already had a special election or have scheduled special elections to hold a referendum. So okay. it may, there may be an ambiguity in the law about exactly where it has to be held or how, how it should be held. Even way, so even still, just I'm going to beat the, the horse a little bit deader. The earliest that someone could even apply for an uh, 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 recreational marijuana 16 in months from now. is 16 months from now, and we have enough time to act between now and then. So I think perhaps um, from my conversation with the town managers, just have this uh, beginning conversation to make sure that um, he and his staff aren't beginning to possibly look at going down the road that uh, the majority or unanimous board of selectmen don't endorse. And I think you're hearing that, that we're asking you to continue. Am I correct on that? And I certainly agree that you know there's no rush. For, I, I just had it in my head that it, had to be in an annual, which means this April or next. I certainly mm -hmm. feel more comfortable, especially by my colleague, Mr. Dunn's remarks on that. So I think that's the purpose of this. You just wanted to make sure that um, the board is aware of um, just these initial conversations, lots more questions to investigate in terms of if we had it, when we could have it, when we couldn't, and, and um, as well as uh, in terms of any Warren article to town meeting this year, I. I think it may be a little premature, but we'll. Yeah, I think we're, we're still looking at whether or not it would be appropriate to um, file an article that would place a zoning moratorium on the location. Um, 
uh, of uh, recreational marijuana, but we're, we're still not, uh, we're still looking at the timing of that as well. Okay. So um, is there anyone here who would like to, do you want to, you don't have to have remarks on this, but it, if, since you waited and as I said it's parallel, but it's up to you, Karen. Did you want to say anything? Um, oh, just come up to the microphone and just say your name and address again, just in case people click. Karen Thomas, Alley, 157 Newport Street. The last remark you made about warrant articles, could you, I, I couldn't quite. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, I sh uh, the chair just asked if we were, if there was anything we needed to do at town meeting, and I said we are still looking at whether or not it would be appropriate this year to file uh, for a zoning moratorium on the location of recreational marijuana facilities. Because they, they would still have to be zoned. Uh, if the community, even if the community was in favor of having recreational marijuana facilities, they would have to be zoned as to where they could, where they could locate. Okay. okay. Um, any further discussion? Any questions? Okay, so thanks for the initial conversation, and I'm sure we'll revisit this again. Uh, we'll now go to correspondence received. Movers seat by. So moved. Mr. Burns, seconded by. Second. Mr. Dunn. Um, any uh, my colleagues have any discussion? Want to refer any of these to uh, other entities? Perhaps send. Uh, Move to send the concerns about the sidewalk repairs to town manager. I have it as well, but Perfect. that's fine. Thank yeah. you. Okay. I'll say, on, on my vacation, I happened to notice that where I was that the instead of pavement where around trees and stuff like that, they had like, it, like instead of asphalt, they had like a spongy material like you'd find on like a kid's playground, all, you know, like, the, but it was applied. And so... When you're walking down the sidewalk, you know how you'd have like the cutaway where the tree is or whatever, and make you you know stumble into it and like and like I do and you know twist your <laughs> ankle. They had like a um, applied layer, so it looks like asphalt, which I'm not sure would satisfy the cor this particular correspondent. But it was a very different material and a very different experience. I thought hmm. it was interesting. I will note that they don't have freezing temperatures, so maybe <laughs> that could have been yeah. <laughs> that could have been the factor that was going on. <laughs> One of the first emails I sent to Adam, I think, when I when I was first elected, was about rubber sidewalks, yeah, around exactly. trees. They're kind of rubberized. Yeah, yeah that and stuff. They're, yeah. They're, they're fairly popular in warm climates. Uh, but so. we, I asked actually, I think Mike Rodemacher looked into it on uh, a request yeah. of mine, and they're, they're fairly expensive to yeah. put in. Yeah. Just plant okay. rubber trees. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, did you have a question? Um, we usually don't really discuss beyond on correspondence received, but. I don't want uh, to Colin discourage Fredericks, you. 42 Rawson Road. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the same material is used on Church Street in uh, Cambridge. So if you're curious as to durability, uh, the town of Cambridge may be able to talk about that some. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, with those referrals on a motion by Mr. Byrne, seconded by Mr. Dunn, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, unanimous vote. New business, Mrs. Sullivan? Um, no new business. Mr. Chapterlane? Uh, just a, a couple uh, brief pieces of new business. Uh, one, as the board knows, uh, the town has undertaken a zoning recodification uh, effort to uh, fully update uh, and really modernize the town's zoning. This is separate, uh, related but separate from the residential study group that is looking at changing zoning uh, or making recommendations to change zoning, uh, zoning in terms of concerns about neighborhood disruption. Um, so as part of that, uh, the town has hired RKG Associates, the same firm that did the master plan, uh, to do the technical work of actually recodifying zoning. And one thing that both RKG has recommended and uh, our planning and community development director, Jenny, Jenny Raitt, is putting together what they're calling an all-board meeting. Uh, all boards that have any kind of permitting or licensing authority that interact with zoning uh, to come together and talk with the RKG associates um, to, in, to have input into the zoning recodification process. So the Board of Selectmen is absolutely invited to that, um, though I, I know with schedules it may be tough to get all five members there. And it is currently tentatively scheduled for Saturday, January 28th from 9 to 11 a.m., most likely in the Senior Center. I'll be sending the Board more information about it um, as, as we firm things up, but I did want to... Um, announce that to the board tonight. We're talking about redevelopment board, zoning board, conservation commission, board of health, historic uh, district commission, historic commission, uh, anybody who goes through the land use and permitting uh, permitting process or is part of that process. And if you can, if you haven't already, a check with attorney Heim. I know in the past when we've gone to sort of similar events, if there were 
were three or more of us going. Um, oh, we'll post it like it's a meeting. So okay, it's okay, that's what. And then yeah. um, between um, Mr. Chapdelaine and uh, Mrs. Skripalka, I'll just check in. I mean, I know all of us will endeavor to be there. Um, I, I mean, I certainly will try, honestly, because it, it, it. But um, I'm just anticipating that at least one of us, if not more, um, will. So if anyone knows in the next week or so, um, if you could let myself or Mrs. Kropelka know, know, so I know, it, you know, at least one, two, whatever of us is going. Because um, if if it's something that it's 50-50, then if I really have to, and I, you know, I can I can do babysitting, but Saturday morning is really tough for me. So um, thank you. Uh, back to you, Mr. Chapman. Yeah, no, no, please, thank you. Uh, also, I uh, just wanted to let the board know that um, I will have. The town manager's budget submission uh, due by the end of this week. Uh, it's normally uh, due by the Town Man uh, Manager Act on January 15th, which is a Sunday. Uh, so I don't think the office will be open here to time stamp in on Sunday. So we're going to endeavor to have it ready on Friday afternoon. Uh, and then perhaps if the board is interested, we could have it as an agenda item on January 23rd for a brief uh, presentation and any discussion that you might have. And then finally, um, just to piggyback from earlier in the meeting on comments that the chair had along with um, uh, Colin, who's here with us tonight, uh, we do plan on January 23rd to have at least one agenda item, if not multiple agenda items, to talk about um, impacts of the, uh, the incoming uh, president-elect. Um, there's been a lot of interest about uh, discussing sanctuary city status or sanctuary town status, uh, and I wanted to make sure that we could have Chief Ryan here to be part of that uh, discussion because so much of that um, is involved with our police work and our police policies. So uh, we're planning on having that. Uh, agenda item <clears throat> on January 23rd, along with uh, maybe a more broad discussion about um, what I've been, I've been trying to talk about all of this as making sure that the community's policies match up with the community's values. Uh, and I think that's the way I'd like for most of us to try to think about that. Um, sanctuary city status is very, or town status is very focused on that. And then there's going to be other matters that I think we want to talk about in that regard. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, when I, I did, did discuss this with uh, Mr. Kiro, um, and he, he raised a good point. I, I think, and after talking with you, Mr. Chaplain, um, it may come out that it's two, possibly three agenda items, but just one right after another, because there may be some sort of overlap. Of course. Uh, for people who may say, of those three issues, I really have some information on number one and three or whatever, as well as um, this board taking a vote for any kind of action. Um, they may want it split up to say, you're asking two things, you're asking three things. So, but they definitely will be one right after another, right after another. I, did, did I, I thought it was a good suggestion that you made, so. Okay, but I'm sorry I interrupted you again. I'm done. <laughs> you're done. done. Mr. Byrne. No new business. Mr. Carroll. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, just, just one item, um, and this is maybe in a similar vein as well to what the manager was just talking about. Um, last week I did attend a subcommittee uh, meeting of the, the uh, Human Rights Commission. They actually pulled together representatives from a number of the uh, volunteer boards, nonprofits, um, uh, arts community and such. They are um, they're launching an initiative called Arlington for All, which, which will seek to kind of um, uh, undertake a number of uh, in initiatives and, and, uh, and uh, projects. Uh, throughout the coming uh, year or, or more. Um, they're still in a brainstorming phase right now, but they did ask that, that I please surprise the board. Surprise, I think the manager was already aware of, of this, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was. That, yes. that um, they are starting these conversations and trying to really s spread the net wide. So similar to the sentiments of the letter that Mr. Dunn um, read that was you know directed to our town employees, really getting that message out throughout the community right now. We, we do know that there is some uh, concern, anxiety, mm. fear in some part, parts of folks, and, and I think there are important things we can do locally to make sure that people feel safe and, and secure here. Just to add some levity to that, I went into one of the law firms I work for downtown Boston today, and three or four of the uh, assistants, um, when I went into their offices, they have altered their calendars. 
So it goes through January 1st, 2nd, and then it goes January 17, 18, January 19, January 19, Jan they, they put 19 <laughs> over the rest of the days after the 20th, just for January. So um, just trying to, I, it, it, I really cracked up at that, but maybe <laughs> when I saw that, I, I like so got it. They're like, everybody gets it when they walk in, because it's kind of that thing that, ooh, can you do that in the workplace? But um, anyways, I digress. Yeah, I, I think the, this project is not specifically related to the uh, election, per right. se. It's just, it's really about Arlington. Yeah. It's about Arlington. So. All set? Yep. Mr. Dunn? Go um, And just, I have a memory of last week. I don't know if it was correspondence received or something that was sent directly to the chairman, and it may already be passed, but it was something from the MMA saying that the chair, there's a meeting coming up Chairman of the board has to be there to vote or designee. Was there something I was supposed to do to make, or did that already happen? Uh, I I don't know if it happened, but normally the chair signs it. I'm there anyways. Right, um, and but it's I the, don't it's have the MMA's to. MMA's annual business meeting. I just want to make sure I, there wasn't something I was supposed to do, so that it it said something like, um, if you're not going to be there, sign the name of the person who is, yeah, so that they can vote. And board info. Okay. It was. It was in board. Info. That's what I'm saying is, do you need? An, yes. My ass. Oh, that's what I'm saying. I just want to make sure that. Um, and I completely forgot to do it. And I, no, I don't get paper anymore. And I'm not being um, sarcastic. But if somebody could make sure I do that, so that you have that, for whatever that meeting is, unless is, is that okay with my colleagues? Because, okay. Um, a uh, motion to adjourn by Mr. Burns, seconded okay. by Mr. Dunn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.